Hello everyone and welcome to a quick Unity tutorial about how to create a simple procedural grid using shaders. In this episode, we're going to make our own graph-based URP shader to display a rectangular grid in world coordinates with some tweakable parameters. This kind of render can be very useful for level design, for example, during the initial whiteboxing phase to easily identify the dimensions of the scene and place the objects in the right place. So our goal would be to have this procedural grid offer a controllable cell size and stroke thickness, some color inputs for the background and the grid lines, and even a toggle to optionally discard the background away and use the grid as an overlay. By the way, remember that you can also get all of the assets we make in this video for free over on GitHub, in this repo where I put all my Unity tutorials assets. And with that in mind, let's get to it and discuss how we can create a URP shader for this procedural grid render. In this first part, we're going to set up a basic shader and its associated material to put on a plane and display a simple black and white rectangular grid like this one. To begin with, let's create our shader and material assets. In this tutorial, we'll work with the URP shader graph tool, so we need to be with the URP pipeline for our project. So be sure to create your project either based on the URP pipeline in the initial template or to install the package afterwards and then make sure that you've set a URP settings asset in your project's graphic settings. Now if you right click in your project doc, you'll see that you can create a new asset of shader graph type. We'll make an unlit graph, call it procedural grid and then right click on this asset to create a new material based on it. If I make a plane in the scene and drag my material on it, you see that it now properly chains all the way to our procedural grid shader. So let's double click the shader graph asset to open it in the shader graph editor and start working on our grid generation logic. Since we want to work with world coordinates, the very first step is to access this global world's position matching our pixel. We can get it using the position node and make sure to keep its space mode to the default world value. Note that if you want to make a procedural grid in local coordinates, meaning one that follows the plane and is relative to this object's origin, you just need to change the world option to object and everything will be computed in the local space coordinates. Anyway, here we can get a feel for our world position value by bringing the output of this node in the base color slot of our fragment output context on the right, and then saving our shader assets to actually refresh the scene. Our plane now displays its global position for each pixel as a color, and we see that we do have something that is red for the positive x, blue for the positive z, magenta, i.e. red plus blue for the positive x and z, and black for the negative values, which is consistent with the global referential we can see in the top right corner. Since our geometry is flat, we're only interested in those two axes here, the x and the z, so let's use a split node to isolate those two components from our initial 3D vector. They are the first and third values, i.e. the R and B out slots. Now, of course, we want our grid to be symmetrical around the origin point, so we don't want the negative values to be treated different, like this. To avoid this, we can take the absolute value of our components using the aptly named absolute node, and if I debug the result for the x-axis, you see that this gives me a black line near zero and white everywhere else. That's because basically, starting from here, the absolute value of my x world coordinate is equal to or greater than one, and so it's outputted as a white color. To actually turn this into multiple grid lines, the idea is to take the remainder of this absolute coordinate divided by a grid step. We can do this with the module node, where we feed our x value at the top and the grid step at the bottom. For example, with a default value of 1, I get something like this. My plane shows a black line for every unit every time my x world coordinate passes a new step, and then we have those black to white gradients in between. And because we have normalized our value, this happens on both sides of the origin point. If we modify the modulo divider value at the bottom, we see that we can control the distance between the lines. So this is where we want to inject some option to control the grid cell size. 
To do this, let's go to the graph's blackboard and create a new parameter for our shader, of type vector2 called cell size. We can also open the graph inspector panel and select this variable to set its default value to 1 on both axes. And then we just have to save our asset to see this new parameter appear in the inspector of our material using our shader. Now to actually use it in our computation, we're going to split the X and Y components like we did before, so that we can control the cell size on each axis, and then use the X output as our modulo divider value. If I refresh the shader, you see that I can now change my value directly in the inspector and see my grid lines along the X axis update in real time accordingly. Ok, we've managed to make some sort of a line pattern, but the problem is that we don't really have sharp strokes at regular intervals. Rather, our plane has those multiple little gradients as the modulo keeps going from 0 to 1 in each grid cell. To fix this, a nice solution is to use the smooth step node. In short, this tool allows us to snap back a value to a given range, and in our case, by passing in the X coordinate as the edge 1 input, a float value for the thickness of our grid lines as the edge 2 input, and 0 as the inner input, we see that our blurry gradients are transformed into nice sharp lines. Again, we can expose this float parameter by converting it to a new property for a shader, the grid thickness, for example with the default value of 0.1. Okay, so that's pretty cool. We now have easy to tweak grid lines along the x axis in both the positive and the negative parts of the horizontal plane. Now we can do the same for the z axis, simply by copying our absolute, modulo, and smooth step nodes and inputting back the z and y components of the world's position and the cell size parameter, respectively. If I output this bottom part of my graph, you see that it does exactly the same thing but in the other direction. Finally, to combine the lines on both axes, we just need to multiply our two results. This will produce a black and white grid mask with black lines and a white background that we can customize using the cell size and the grid thickness properties in our inspector. Now, there is this little glitch in the middle because there are basically two lines side by side, so we get twice the edge thickness here. But I feel like it's not that big of a deal for this tutorial, and it even helps highlight the origin of the world, so I actually quite like it this way, and I won't spend time fixing this. Rather, I want to keep improving on this procedural grid shader, and see how to use this grayscale mask as a base, and bring in some colors. Ok, we've now got a nice black and white mask for a grid that we can tweak easily in the inspector. That's pretty cool, but of course, it would be even better if we could also pick the color of the background and the grid lines to really customize the whole thing to our will. Luckily, this is actually quite quick to add to our shader. In short, we can use this grayscale map to differentiate between the background and the lines, and just multiply this value by the color to tint it properly. So let's define two new parameters for our shader, background color and grid color and initialize the background color to be white, like it's currently. Now we can drag those values to our graph and connect them as follows. To tint the background, we just need to multiply our final grid mask by the value, and it will directly color the background as expected. The trick is that all the black areas are ignored, because they basically nullify the result of the multiplication, so this will only take into account the background part. And because our initial color is a pure white, multiplying it with our background color parameter just replaces each component with the right R, G and B values. For the grid lines, it's the exact same idea, but we need to reverse our mask so that only these line parts are taken into account. So we're going to squeeze in a Y- node that turns white into black and vice versa, and then multiply this new result by a grid color parameter. At this point, we've therefore got a tinted background in here and tinted grid lines in here, using our shader's color parameters defined in the blackboard. To combine them, we just need to add both results. The black parts of each separate computation will be filled by the other, and if we put this final value in our output slot, we see that we get back our black and white grid from before. Except that now we can modify the two colors with the parameters that have shown up in the inspector.
so we can easily tweak the color of the background or the lines. But now, what if we already have another mesh behind, or some background that is not just a solid color, and we just want our grid to be an overlay on top, without any background of its own? As a final improvement, we're going to see how to allow a grid to be transparent if need be. To wrap up this little shader, let's add a last option to remove the background from our grid and only show the colored lines if we want to use it as an overlay. We'll create this toggle as a new parameter in a shader of boolean type called transparent, which can be used in a branch node in the predicate slot. This will basically allow our graph to choose between two computation paths depending on the value of this variable. The point here will be to condition the alpha value of our shader on this option. If it's off, then the alpha is 1 everywhere, because we want our mesh to be fully opaque. But if transparent is on, then the alpha will be given by our grid mask. Like before though, we'll use the reverse version, so that the grid lines are the white parts, meaning with an alpha of 1, and the background is the black part, meaning with an alpha of 0. The only problem is that, as you can see, our shader doesn't yet have any alpha output. For now, the only thing we can output from our fragment context is the color. That's because our shader graph asset doesn't have the right settings. To be able to use an alpha value, we need our shader to either be transparent or opaque but with alpha clipping enabled. Here we won't be needing continuous alpha values, we'll just have 0 or 1, so we can use alpha clipping and stick with an opaque shader. This will be slightly better in terms of performance and it won't impact our visual at all. So let's open our graph inspector panel, go to the graph settings tab and toggle on the alpha clipping option over here. You see that this instantly reveals two new slots in our fragment output context, the alpha and the alpha clip threshold. We'll simply drag the result of our branch node in the alpha slot and set the clip threshold to 1, to properly differentiate between the black and white parts. If we resave the shader, we see that now, as soon as we set transparent to true in the inspector, our background disappears, and we are left with just the grid lines. We can still change the cell size, the thickness of the stroke, the colors, and of course, if we toggle the alpha logic back off, we get our background again. So there you go, you've now got a basic procedural grid shader in world coordinates made in URP and you can tweak it in various ways to customize it to your liking. Anyway, with that said, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned a few interesting things about creating shaders in URP using the shader graph. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you have other ideas of new tricks that you'd like to learn, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, thanks a lot for watching and take care.